We're going to begin. We're going to be discussing the parsha uh, according to the commentary, according to an explanation of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And um, we're going to be talking about a uh, interesting topic of the difference between the mitzvahs that the patriarchs did and the mitzvahs that we do after the giving of the Torah. And what's interesting is that the mitzvah of Mila is, a, is like a hybrid because on the one hand, the reason why we do the mitzvah of Mila is because Hashem, you know, gave us the Torah at Har Sinai, and that obligates us to do a circumcision on our, on our boys. But the bracha of the circumcision is to enter the, 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 to enter the circumcised Lach Nisai in the treaty of Avraham Avinu. So we mention Avraham, but at the same time, the reason why we do the mitzvah is because of Har Sinai, because we're commanded at Har Sinai, not because Hashem told Avraham. In other words, the, the giving of the Torah at Har Sinai is the, is the source of our obligation. And um, so in any event, uh, what we see is that the, the mitzvahs, um, the mitzvah of Mila is given in this week's Parsha. And there is some connection from the mitzvah of the, of the Avais, of Avraham, to our, there is some connection, even though the real reason why we do it is because we were given the Torah at Har Sinai, but it's connected to Avraham of him, uh, our bris mim. So we're going to be discussing that mitzvah. And um, we're also going to be answering some other questions along the way. So the first question that has to be asked is, why did Avraham wait until he was 99 years old to fulfill the mitzvah of bris milah. Every other mitzvah Avraham did, he fulfilled the mitzvah uh, without waiting for Hashem to tell him to, to, to do this mitzvah or that mitzvah. He knew the Torah before the, to the Torah was given. He had a uh, certain vision that he was able to see. He knew uh, uh, you know, different mitzvahs, for example, keeping Shabbos, um, uh, kosher, even Noyach, it says, knew about the laws of kosher and non-kosher. And so we are told, we are taught that the Avais, all the patriarchs, they kept the entire Torah, Ad Shaloi Nitna, even before it was given, because uh, the Torah wasn't given until a few generations later. And Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, all of them, they kept the entire Torah even, even before it was given. So the question is, you know, if he kept the entire Torah before it was given, he should have kept the mitzvah of Mila. And I must say, it would have been maybe even uh, a, good, a good idea for him because it's probably easier to have a circumcision when you're a teenager, when you're, you're, when you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s, it's probably a lot easier than to have a circumcision when you're 99. Uh, it would, it, so it, it, it is surprising that Abraham, you know, just kept pushing it or pushed it off and didn't do it. And he was waiting for uh, the command from Hashem. Uh, Rabbi Smith. Yes. Uh, question. Was the yeshiva of Shem and Ava in existence at this time? So we are told that uh, they, 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 they were, that, uh, for example, uh, uh, even Yaakov went and studied there. So Avraham, for sure, in Avraham's time, they were around. Okay, so if they were around, uh, everything that in the... Uh, 
everything that the Avos knew uh, before Matan Torah must have come from the neighbor. Am I right? Or possibly right? Well, uh, that's a good point that, you know, the shame and Aver obviously had some uh, knowledge of the Torah and the Avos had knowledge of the Torah. Um, you know, it, 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 it's unclear to us the level of shame and Aver versus Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov in knowledge. So, uh, you know what I mean? I don't know uh, how to evaluate. Uh, we know that Yaakov learned in, you know, the yeshiva. I believe it was only Aver at the time because I think shame had passed away already. But um, like when Yaakov studied there, but we aren't told that Aver taught Yaakov. We know that Yaakov sat and learned. Uh, but we don't know, like, did, did Aver know the laws of mikvah and uh, Yaakov didn't? Did he had to hear them from Aver or did, you know, uh, or was there laws of Erov that, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a little vague. Um, maybe, there, maybe there are some sources in the Medrash, but I'm not aware of them. So we don't know to what, you know, who taught who and what was, you know, what, what the uh, what the knowledge was, but it would seem like they all knew. Probably, the, it would seem like they all knew the written Torah, and maybe they discussed it. You know, and that's what it. You know, and, and obviously more than the written Torah, they probably knew a lot of the oral laws as well and the explanations, and it was probably being discussed by them. So uh, you know, so so that would be a uh, a good question if if only there was someone who could answer it. Like, what exactly did they study? In, from who. So it's a good question, uh, Jerry. Um, but in any event, uh, uh, you know, Abraham definitely knew the uh, the law of Mila, and you're probably right that Shaman Aver probably also knew the law of Mila. So this question is asked, it's not the, uh, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe is not the first one to ask this question, but he's going to give an innovative answer uh, that I don't believe is uh, brought down anywhere um, so we're gonna we're gonna soon see how the Lubavitcher Rebbe answers this. But Ben, you have a question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say I don't think Abel was there before Abraham because Abraham was the first Jew. So it was after Abraham started teaching his manat, you know, the the only God. Then then you can create a yeshiva. It, it does say that Noyach knew the laws of kosher, and uh, Shame was the son of Noah, and yeah. Aver was a you know a grandchild or great grandchild. So uh, you know, so so would you know they obviously were they, knew, they, they might have known some laws, but they are not considered believers in yeah. the one God, are they? So, you know, it's a good question. Where, where did Shem and Aver fit in? Um, and for whatever reason, why did Hashem not choose them to be the patriarchs? You know, these are, these are good questions. And, um, you know, what's interesting Maybe is Maybe they, they were not what? They were not what? I, I can't hear you. I don't know if you've got somehow... Uh, your sound is some, something's wrong. Or maybe my sound is something wrong. Uh, can anyone hear Ben? Ben, no. we cannot hear you. Okay. What about Melchizedek? Didn't he follow the laws of circumcision? S say that again, who? Uh, the king Melchizedek. Uh-huh. Uh, we don't... Remember when we don't... He visited Abraham and uh, they yeah. made a... Uh, yeah, we don't Come believe that. Yeah, good question. But we don't believe that Shame, Aver, or Malkitzedek. We don't believe that they uh, that they actually uh, did circumcision. It's not wouldn't be uh, uh, something that we would assume. Um, and 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 the point is that you know they might have studied the laws that God is going to give the Jewish people, but they weren't obligated to keep them. You know, there, there, there's definitely no obligation. On though you know they were they were studying God's wisdom, uh, you know, and, and they they were becoming spiritual, but they weren't um, they weren't obligated and responsible to keep the mitzvahs. 
no question, even the patriarchs, they weren't obligated to keep the mitzvahs. They did it as a extra uh, level of uh, stringency. And they, you know, uh, maybe they were passionate. They wanted to keep the mitzvahs, but they weren't uh, definitely not obligated to. So we, 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 we uh, do not assume that anyone else kept the circ- the law of circumcision before uh, Avraham. Rabbi Smith. Yes. I, I'm thinking that uh, the, the, there's 10 generations between Noyach and Avraham. Right. And it seems to be that Shem and Aver were the two most prominent people in the entire time period between Noach and Avraham. That's why they're pointed out so clearly in the Torah and that they had this yeshiva that was unique and they were unique, I think. Take it away. Okay. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, good point. I was actually in their yeshiva. I'm not in the yeshiva, but in the place, in the physical place in Israel. Uh-huh. Where is it located? I'm um, trying to remember. Where was the yeshiva shaman ever? Shiel? Huh? Yeshiva shaman ever. Where was, was where? I forget. I'll, I'll check uh-huh. it out. Uh-huh. Well, in any event, it doesn't really clarify, you know, if they had a yeshiva, like to what extent, you know, were they... You know what level of learning were they, were, you know, were they uh, doing? Why, you know, what was what was their uh, knowledge? You know, what extent of knowledge did they have? I mean, definitely an interesting topic. I don't know if there are midrashic sources to uh, you know to help uh, help us, but uh, we're going to talk about uh, Avraham's mitzvah bris milah, which we read about in the parsha. So. Um, so the so the question I asked was why did Avraham wait to have his circumcision uh, until the age of 99 when Hashem told him to, he should have done it much earlier. And um, in order to understand this, we have to understand that the patriarchs, they did all their mitzvahs in a certain sense differently than we do them ourselves. And they accomplished something different from their mitzvahs than what we accomplish through our mitzvahs. And the reason is, why did they accomplish something different? Because when you are commanded from Hashem to do something, you are connecting with the commander when you do it. You have a certain relationship because the commander Hashem is asking you to do it and you are fulfilling that command. So you are connecting with Hashem and Hashem's infinite powers you are connecting with. When you do the mitzvah on your own, so you know this is something that Hashem wants, but Hashem never commanded you. So you actually are not able to reach the highest levels of connection with Hashem because it's coming from you. You are the one who is uh, deciding that you want to do this. See, if, if it comes from Hashem, if it's on his terms, then you connect to him in a, in a higher level. If you're doing it on your terms, you're connecting to Hashem on a level, on your own level. On your, if you're doing it on your own terms, you're connecting to, you know, you're connecting in some way because you're doing what, you know, what Hashem wants, but he never told you to do it. So you're connecting in a, in a way that's, that's like, you know, limited to who you are. So there's a great benefit of connecting to Hashem on his terms and not on your terms. And so if when it comes to mitzvahs that the patriarchs did, they would do certain, you know, these, the mitzvahs, but the mitzvahs didn't penetrate the physical world. So for example, uh, Avraham put on tefillin. Would his tefillin become holy? Not really. To fill in is something physical, and it doesn't absorb the holiness because it's physical. It's the exact opposite of holiness. And the only way it could be, it could handle the spiritual uh, 
uh, holiness that tefillin is supposed to have is if Hashem commands it, and then you know, you, and then you wear it as tefillin. It would then be able to absorb that holiness because Hashem commanded it. He's able to break through the boundaries of physical, and he's able to bring holiness into that into that spiritual, bring bring holiness into that physical item into that into into the tefillin. Now, to be more specific, uh, we do find that Yaakov did some spiritual uh, type of tefillin. Uh, in other words, he did some mitzvah of tefillin. The Zohar says he he was uh, when he was stripping off the uh, wood, the the the, the pieces of uh, the branches, the the bark from the from the uh, branches that he had planted. Uh, there is a, a story in the Torah where uh, Yaakov, um, Jacob was was given a a, a, a um, he was given a, a a business opportunity from his father-in-law. He was given this uh, that if any animal that was born spotted and striped, he would be able to keep, and uh, you know and and. and uh, and any of the regular white animal, you know, uh, uh, solid animals, uh, solid colored animals, uh, they would go to his father. So Yaakov, it says he stripped off some uh, uh, pieces of uh, some uh, the bark from from uh, some branches, and he planted them. When the animals were drinking, they would look at these, uh, you know, they would look at these uh, branches and. Um, it actually ended up that all these animals, uh, they gave birth to spotted and striped animals, and he was able to become extremely wealthy. Now, uh, the, the Zohar says that, you know, when you, when you strip off the, the wood, what does it look like? It looks like when you take, when you, when you take some strips off a, a branch, so it looks like tefillin. Because you have the the tefillin, uh, it's almost like tefillin is being round wound around it. You know, it looks like there's a tefillin strap, tefillin strap. So the Zohar says that that was his tefillin that Yaakov did. Uh, he did this obviously. He had some, I you know, in, in the uh, you know we we don't we don't understand the, you know obviously all the uh, kabbalistic ideas, but there was some spiritual. Uh, element of tefillin that Yaakov accomplished with these with these uh, pieces of, of wood, um, and what that means is Rabbi, would you take a yeah the question? Sure. Regarding Abraham, when yeah. did Hashem command him, Abraham to circumcise himself? At what age? Do we know? Ninety nine. At ninety nine, when was he married? To well, Sarah, we know he what was al he was already married at the age of seventy five when he traveled. So okay. he was married for many decades before. And and when he left his father's house to listen to the command of Hashem, how old was he? So again, that was seventy five. That was when he traveled. That's when he left his father's house. Correct. Well. Uh, yeah, I mean, he had left with his father from Orkastin to Choron, and now he actually left his father. Uh, so, you know, uh, whatever, however you want to call his father's house. Okay. Uh, but the one in so, his father's house in Choron, he left at 75. Okay. So your reasoning was, sounds logical to me, that he didn't want to listen to Hashem to command, for that commandment. He waited until he understood it, and then he did it when he was ready. Well, so, I, I didn't say that. I just said that the patriarchs, when they did mitzvahs, they were on their own terms because they were not commanded. And the... Um, all right, what... Okay, I understand that. What, what I was trying to get at is uh, I had a brother, of course, he had a Brit Mila, of course. Didn't Hashem tell Abraham to do the same thing? To wait the eight days? So, Hashem, or, or circumcision right away? 
I don't understand why Abraham waited. For himself? So, so yes. Hashem did not tell Abraham until Abraham was 99. But Abraham knew about it wow. in advance. He knew about the Torah. And so he read it even before he you know, read it. He, he had known it even before he was commanded it. It's almost like when, you know, when uh, they're going to tell you to clean your room, you know, you know it's coming, but you could just clean your room or you could wait till your mother says, you know, uh, please clean your room. You know, you could do it and you know in advance you're supposed to do it. But, you know, but, or, or, you, or in this case, it's not exactly the same because he didn't have an obligation to do it, but he knew it would be a nice thing to do in advance. Okay. And yet okay. he waited uh, till Hashem commanded. All right. So now I'm, I'm understanding a little more that I want to share with you. If I'm right, tell me. If I'm wrong, tell me. When Hashem commanded him to take the, uh, the dagger and kill his son, and that Hashem saw that he was going to do it, then he said, you don't have to kill to sacrifice your son. Because he realized at that moment that Abraham listened to whatever Hashem said. He showed his loyalty, his allegiance, his love, okay. etc. cetera. Okay. okay. So now the rest of it makes a little more sense to me. Okay. If that helps, then, uh, then wonderful. That's, uh, that's great. Well, is okay. that the way it, is that the way it, was interpreted I'm by the not ancient sure the connection, uh, uh, honestly and in the story of of uh you know of, of the akeda where he brought his son up as a sacrifice right, right that story happens you know 38 years later so okay. uh, you know i'm not sure what okay. what the connection was but uh you know it, you know I, I i guess if it helps understand you know the uh the personality, I guess it helps you understand his personality. That's great. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to mute everyone and we're going to continue. Let's see. Okay. okay. So, um, uh, so Loretta, yeah, I hope, I hope that's, it's clear. Uh, we're going to continue the, uh, so I was mentioning that the patriarchs, they, uh, you know, they, they fulfilled the commandments, um, but they didn't accomplish what we, what, what we accomplish when we do mitzvahs. And I was talking about the, the sticks, the maklois, these uh, sticks that, uh, that Yaakov used to, um, to add, what, what he was doing was something very spiritual, uh, drawing down uh, 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 the same thing that we accomplished with Tvil, and he was, he, was, he was drawing it down. The only thing, the only difference is that we actually bring those levels of holiness and connect it with the animal skin that we use for tefillin. And Avraham, I'm sorry, and Yaakov, when he did it with, his, with those sticks, we don't find that he made them into something holy and he had to, you know, uh, bury them properly afterwards or uh, he kept them, you know, as sacred items. We, 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 we understand that they weren't holy at all. And the reason is because the holiness did not penetrate the physical world. After the giving of the Torah, when God gave us commandments, that allows us to uh, do mitzvahs on God's terms. And when you do mitzvahs on Hashem's terms, the physical and spiritual differences are able to fall apart and they're able to merge together, meaning the, 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 the separation between the physical and the spiritual falls off and and, and with coming from Hashem, he can, he can override those, those rules, those limitations, and the physical can become holy. So our tefillin, we're not allowed to bring in a bathroom. Our tefillin is holy. It's not supposed to be on the floor. Our tefillin, you know, there, there's, there's rules of holiness with our tefillin, but we don't find the same rules with the, uh, with the with sticks that Yaakov used for his tefillin. And the same thing applies to all the mitzvahs that the patriarchs did, that the physical world you know, did not really have the uh, effects that our mitzvahs accomplished. They, they, of course, the patriarchs, patriarchs did accomplish uh, great things with their mitzvahs, and they reached high levels themselves. They were able to uh, become more spiritual and, uh, you know, and, and understand deeper, deeper concepts and uh, connect with and bring, uh, you know, uh, awaken high levels of, of holiness. Uh, um, 
but they weren't able to draw it down into the physical world that it would stay in the physical world. So that is the story with the patriarchs mitzvahs. Now, the, on the other hand, although they're very different than our mitzvahs, but they also are called a simen lebanim. The actions of the patriarchs are a, uh, they're a, like a source, they're a, uh, uh, origin for what's going to happen with the with the with with their children. So, in other words, the 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 the, the fact that the patriarchs did um, these did certain mitzvahs or did some mitzvahs or did all the mitzvahs they kept the whole Torah. That is sort of like a um, it gives us some type of a energy that we're not starting something new. We already, we have it as our inheritance, so to speak, from the patriarchs. It's a, it was a, uh, it was already started from the patriarchs and, uh, and we are, you know, and, and, and we are continuing uh, with what they began. So this term, I see of a similar bonum, is an interesting term. It's brought down in the, in the commentaries on the Gemara, on the uh, commentaries on Chumash and the, the Midrashic sources and so on. Uh, so it, you, it doesn't use exactly the same words, but it says whatever happened to the patriarchs happened is a simon. It's a sign for the children. So, it, the, the, but the the terminology is used in, in other commentaries as well. There's a Ramban that that mentions this idea. My say of a simon labanim. The actions of the patriarchs are a sign for the for their children, and um, it gives us strength. It gives us uh, they they paved the way for us, and. Um, uh, because of that, um, what comes out is that they did their mitzvahs, but their mitzvahs are very different than ours, but yet they paved the road for us. So what the Lubavitcher Rebbe wants to say is that, it, it, you know, it's, it's interesting that they're not exactly the same as our mitzvahs, but yet they're paving the road for us. So the Lubavitcher Rebbe wants to say that there had to be one mitzvah that would be very similar to our mitzvahs. <clears throat> In this way, their, all of their actions, all of their mitzvahs can be considered paving the road for the Jewish people. So we needed to have one mitzvah that was very similar to the Jewish, to the, to the, to the Jewish people's mitzvahs later after Mount Torah, after the giving of the Torah. In this way, now they can be considered to have Paved the road to be simon la bottom. I see of a simon la And where do we see such a concept? Um, so, um, what we find is that in the prophet Ezekiel, we find that he was commanded to. Um, he was commanded to uh, uh, to uh, give over a prophecy, and um, and Hashem told him that he should lie on his left side and lie on his right side. Hashem told him to do some physical actions, and by doing that, uh, you know. Hashem gave him the prophecy. Uh, and the question is, what, what, you know, what was the connection? What did he need to have these, uh, you know, physically he had to lie on, on this side, lie on that side. Uh, it's in chapter four of Ezekiel. And uh, what it comes out is that uh, in order for the prophecy uh, to um, actually become physical, uh, and not stay in a spiritual state, um, Hashem had to ask him, uh, connect it with something uh, physical, um, and this way the prophecy would also connect with the physical world. Meaning there has to be one part connected to physical, and then everything can somehow connect to the physical. So, here we're talking about the patriarchs. They had one mitzvah that they, or Abraham had this one mitzvah that was connected to 
um, to the Jewish people, to the way the Jewish people do mitzvahs after the giving of the Torah. And through that mitzvah, um, um, all of the mitzvahs that he fulfilled were all became sort of like connected to the physical world. Uh, be, in other words, as a way of paving the road for the Jewish people. So we see that similar, a similar idea with Ezekiel, that by uh, somehow connecting the prophecy with uh, a physical way he was going to lie down and, and hear the, and, and listen to the prophecy, uh, that allowed that the entire prophecy will become practically uh, uh, happen and not just stay in the physical realm. What that means is that, you know, there are certain uh, things that are uh, given to us, but they stay in the spiritual realm. Like, for example, uh, Hashem could plan on making someone rich. And the only thing is that the person never buys the lotto or he never looks for a job. He never tries and so his blessing for wealth is right there in the spiritual world. And Hashem blessed him on Rosh Hashanah that you are going to be rich this year. And so he's got maybe uh, $30 million waiting in the spiritual world. This blessing is waiting and hovering over him. And yet the person doesn't invest any money. He doesn't buy the lotto and he doesn't look for a job. And so that blessing stays in the spiritual realm. It never becomes physical. And uh, this idea that certain things could stay spiritual and not end up becoming physical, you know, it's, it's spoken about in Hasidic literature, the, you know, the, the fact that we have to, by us doing mitzvahs, we, we uh, bring down, we can, of course, bring holiness into the physical, but we're also, we can make channel of like the Hashem doesn't want to make a revealed miracle. So he wants us to do certain things in the physical world. And we're able to draw down the spiritual uh, blessings that are waiting for us. And uh, they can become, become physical. Uh, so, uh, so this is a example of uh, doing something physical and, uh, uh, this example of Ezekiel, and it allowed that the the uh, the spiritual uh, blessing to uh, to affect the physical to affect the physical world, and the same thing applied to Abraham, that by him doing this mitzvah um, with the physical body, um, uh, which is the bris milah, so he was able to uh, bring holiness into the physical body. Um, and the, the, uh, the, 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 the other mitzvahs that he did are considered, they're considered to be a, 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 a paved road for the future of the Jewish people. So now, Rabbi Smith, yes. what, what was the, what was the prophecy that was immediately connected to the, uh, first Mila that you're addressing with Avraham? The, the prophecy connected to Abraham's bris milah? Right, the, the bris milah is the physical portion. Where's the prophetic portion? No, it, it's, not, it's not that Abraham had a prophecy connected to it. It's that the, 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 uh, the spirituality, the holiness of the mitzvahs were able to connect to the physical world. In other words, it's the, it's the spiritual part of the mitzvah, which normally the patriarchs were not able to uh, infuse holiness into the physical. But here with this mitzvah, the spirituality of the, uh, uh, you know, of the bris was able to be uh, merged with the physical body. I think I, think I might have answered my, my own question. The, um, could it be that when the, the Malachim visited Avraham, during his three days and announced that uh, one of them announces that Sarah a baby in a year. Could that be the prophecy that's attached to the physical act of the circumcision? <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting thought. Um, you know, that, that it should actually materialize. Uh, it was immediate I mean, during his pain. 
because the angel came while he was uh, during the uh, a few days after the third, the third day of the of the circumcision, and so it, so you want to say that 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 prophecy sort of materialized um, in the physical world because he did the physical uh, circumcision and uh, the, uh, the the prophecy materialized. That's uh, you know that's an interesting uh, interesting thought. Um, you know it's uh, uh, I guess uh, you know. Very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, enhancing that, uh, adding that thought to our to the class. Yeah. So um, uh, now the mitzvah that uh, that we are talking about here is the mitzvah of bris milah, and the mitzvah of bris milah it says it'll be a treaty in your flesh. So uh, what we see is that. Not only is it a uh, treaty, a one-time thing, but it's a bris oila, it says, a treaty forever. And so the uh, connection between the, uh, the bris and, uh, you know, and the, Jew, the Jew that has the circumcision is that it's a, on the one hand, it's a, it's, it's a action of a mitzvah, and additionally, it is a continuous action. It's, it's, it, it's constant. It stays with the person. And the reason for that, why is it a mitzvah? Why is it considered a continuous mitzvah? Because um, it's not only a mitzvah to have the circumcision, but it's a, or to do the circumcision, but it's a mitzvah to be circumcised, meaning every day that a person is circumcised, he is fulfilling a mitzvah. And uh, we find this in Maimonides' writes that if a person draws back their foreskin, um, what exactly that means is a little unclear. Um, there is a one explanation that it means that there were people that sewed back in the, in the time of the Greeks, in the time of Hanukkah, there were some of the Hellenists that they were, uh, you know, uh, changing sides from the Jewish people. They, they, they went to become, uh, they wanted to go onto the Greek side and uh, drop their Yiddishkeit. And um, they, uh, there were some of them that wanted to play the Olympics, uh, which is the Greek, uh, was, was the, uh, the popular thing then in Greece. And that's when it started in those days. Is they used to play the Olympics naked. And so there were Jewish people that had uh, decided they wanted to uh, look like the Greeks. So they, um, they uh, sewed, had it sewn back on. They had their circumcision. I don't, I don't think they had their circumcision sewn back on, but they had surgically somehow a, a circumcision sewed back, a, a, a uh, you know, a piece of skin sewed back on or that it should look like they were uh, uncircumcised so that they could play the Olympics with everyone else. Uh, that's the way the Olympics were played originally. They were played, uh, when, you know, without clothes. And so the, um, so that could be the meaning of hamayshech or lasse, that if a person uh, sews it, have it, has it surgically sewn back on, or it could mean that it's pulled to look like it's, uh, you know, even without surgery, just to pull it in a way that it, looks like it's sewn back on. So these are considered a, a terrible sin. So um, what we see is that it's not enough just to be circumcised, but you have to stay circumcised because if it was enough just to be circumcised, so then afterwards, whatever someone does afterwards should make a difference. But obviously the mitzvah is to stay circumcised. So it's a treaty forever. It has to be, it has to be uh, everlasting. And so we have these two parts to the mitzvah that, um, that it's, uh, I mean, not only an act of a mitzvah, but it's also a mitzvah that uh, is a continuous mitzvah. And um, uh, the, the mitzvah of the bris, it, number one is it, it is, it, it is in the body. It's in the flesh. It's not just you use the flesh. Let's say you use your hand to give charity. It's not just, that the hand is being used to do a mitzvah, but rather that the mitzvah is part and parcel of the flesh. So that's number one. There's a 
there's a uh, there's a uniqueness to this mitzvah that it's actually not just a regular mitzvah uh, that you use the the body, the physical, to do it, but it, it's in the physical. It's in the physical body. It's a it, it, it's it connects fully with the physical part and parcel of the physical body. And number two is that this mitzvah is a mitzvah that is a continuous mitzvah. Um, and it stays with the person their whole life. Um, in fact, uh, there's a story in the Gemara that says that King David, um, when he went into a bathhouse, he uh, was he felt um, that uh, depressed that he didn't have any mitzvahs with him. And uh, because, you know, he was in the bathhouse, so he didn't have his tzitzis, you know, didn't have his yarmulke, and um, and uh, then he was uh, um, comforted by the fact that he saw he has his bris. Uh, now the question is, what is what, what does it do if he had you know that he had a bris when he was a baby? What what does it help him if you know he also put tefillin on uh, in the morning, you know? And for some reason he was in the in the bathhouse. He felt good. Oh. I feel good. I have a mitzvah. Feel good that you have a mitzvah. Uh, what well, you know, he has a mitzvah of circumcision. The mitzvah was done when he was a baby. But the answer is that the mitzvah of circumcision uh, is not just the mitzvah that happened when he was a baby. It is a mitzvah that um, that is a continuous mitzvah. And therefore, even in the bathhouse, he's fulfilling a mitzvah by the fact that he is circumcised. So that, that proves that it, it continues even afterwards. Okay, so uh, the... Um, so the, the uniqueness of the mitzvah of circumcision, what we're seeing is that it has two benefits let me just uh, mute everyone here. I have a question. Oh, Andrea, yes. You can unmute yourself. Andrea, unmute yourself and you can ask. Okay, good. So, Bris obviously is for the the male Jews, and they're, they're going to have a mitzvah of their whole life that starts when they're babies. What is an equivalent for a woman? And I don't necessarily mean a Bris on their clitoris, either. So the um, the the, the uh, it's a very good question. Question. Um, women are considered automatically to be circumcised. Believe it or not, it's uh, they are command mahila done. It says it is as if they are circumcised. But generally, the way we look at it, you have to mute every. You have to mute because there's too much background noise. Um, generally, the way we look at the 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 the, the, the mitzvahs are uh, husband and wife are a team, and so certain mitzvahs the woman does that she's obligated in, and that is beneficial to the husband, and certain mitzvahs the husband does, and that is beneficial to his wife, and so the fact that the husband is circumcised in a certain sense gives some type of just like he puts tefillin on, and somehow that's. Uh, considered like the the woman's a uh, fulfillment for the woman um so the idea is that as long as the woman encourages or doesn't discourage him from uh putting tefillin on she sort of gets part of the mitzvah so as long as she doesn't encourage him to sew back on his circumcision uh i guess she is uh fulfilling a part of that you know she is somehow getting part of that that, that mitzvah that's done by the husband, just like he benefits also from the wife when she takes challah and she goes to the mikvah and so on. He gets he he is benefiting from that. It's sort of like a, a team, um, you know, and, and that's how uh, you know that's how we consider it that everyone is is getting you know a portion of, of the mitzvah. And the same thing applies with um, in, in general. And you know, the, the, the king has certain mitzvahs, the kohanim have certain mitzvahs, so the Jewish people benefit from. You know, from these mitzvahs that are being done by by others. Uh, yes, Thomas, you have a you have a question. Yes, um, very does. It's a good thing 
that women do not have something physical to mark them as Jews as men have, because during the Holocaust, women were used by Jews to infiltrate and to plant bombs on railroad tracks and all this, because if they were captured, the Nazis would not know that they were Jewish, whereas a man, they would know immediately that he was Jewish. Uh-huh, uh-huh, interesting. So in that particular circumstance, it's, it's an advantageous thing not to have a physical uh, uh, mark that you're Jewish. It's, it's sort of like uh, the women have a more co a higher connection to spirituality that they don't need the, you know, maybe uh, maybe something along those lines that they're so, you know, uh, connected to, to the spiritual that uh, they, you know, they don't, they, they don't like need it maybe in their, in their physical body while a man, he sort of needs it in order to be able to become a little more holy. We don't have, we wouldn't have the, if we didn't have the bris, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to, uh, uh, you know, stay, stay in the level of holiness that we're supposed to, uh, possibly, just, uh, just throwing a thought. But it's definitely a good question, and it, it's something to look into, uh, you, know, how, how, you know, how it exactly um, it can be explained uh, and why Hashem only wanted Avraham and not Sarah to have her circ to have a circumcision. And, um, you know, it definitely is a, uh, it's a good question. But, uh, you know, the, I believe it goes along the lines of we, you know, that that the team and and and, and you know that somehow connected to that. Yes, Ben. Ben is no. is wearing a shaitel for a woman an obligation? <laughs> wearing a shaitel. Well, uh, it's not really the topic. Maybe of this. that maybe that would be the marker. Well, you know. In any event, it's uh, it, it's a topic of another discussion. Of course, we consider uh, you know the hair okay. of a woman to be immodest if it's if it's not covered, um, because we consider it beautiful, something that's uh, only uh, you know not supposed to attract others. So definitely, she, it should be covered, uh, you know. But anyway, it's not really the topic of this discussion. So um, uh, I'm, let me let me just finish off over here. Um, so. The the idea of um, um, the idea of um, uh, uh, fulfilling the mitzvah with women is interesting because there is a, a famous question. Um, uh, there is a fa there is a famous question. One of the commentaries on the Talmud asks. He says, um, "Why does the Gemara uh, have to prove from a verse that?" women do not have to circumcise their, their sons. It's an obligation on the father to circumcise their sons and not on the mother. And the Gemara proves it from a source, from a, from a verse. And the, 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 the question in the, on the commentary, the Tosfis, one of the commentaries on the Talmud, he asks, why, uh, why do you need a source to prove that a woman doesn't have to circumcise her son? The obligation's on the husband. Uh, it, it's obvious because circumcision is a mitzvah by day. Have you ever been at a bris at night? No, they don't. Then, uh, the circumcision has to be by day. And so uh, if it's a mitzvah by day, women are not obligated in uh, time limited mitzvahs. So we should, it should, it should, the Gemara should simply say it's a time uh, limited mitzvah. It's only a mitzvah by day. And therefore, women are exempt. And yet the Talmud says, has to bring a proof. It brings a different proof. It could just say simply, it's a, it's a time-limited mitzvah. And the, the, according to what we're explaining, it's not, it's not a question because the mitzvah of doing the circumcision is a time-limited mitzvah, but the mitzvah of being circumcised is a constant mitzvah. And because that part of the mitzvah is constant, you would think that the mother would have an obligation to circumcise her son in order to fulfill that constant mitzvah, which a woman is obligated in. Women are obligated in constant in all the constant mitzvahs. So that, that is the reason why the Talmud needs to bring a verse to explain why, uh, you know, why, why, why a woman would not be uh, obligated. Of course, it, of course she should, 
but it's not considered wrong if she didn't go, you know, if she didn't go out of her way to circumcise her son. It, it's not her obligation. It's, it's an obligation on the husband. Of course, she just had the baby. It's not so, wouldn't be so easy for her to run around. But, um, but nevertheless, the, the Talmud says she's not obligated. Yes, uh, uh, Gloria. Gloria? Okay, if, if it's not her son, may a woman do a circumcision? May a woman study and get certified to be a moil? If so, it's not her own son? It, it's interesting you asked the question. There is an argument in the, in the Code of Jewish Law. If a woman does a circumcision, can she, can she make the blessing? Uh, uh, for the for the circumcision, so it's it's it, it's actually argued between two uh, uh, two opinions, but, uh, but but there definitely is a source. I mean, there there are areas where uh, uh, you know there, there there definitely have been women um, moils, you know. Uh, yes, uh, Tom. Tom. Yeah, well, I was going to say Moses' son. Mo Moses' son was circumcised by his wife. Right. 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 Now, was that before the Torah was given or after? What's that? Well, that was before Torah was given, but it, but it still was done. Yes, it was done. It was done, correct. But again, the laws of circumcision are are from after the you know that 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 we are obligated and is based on after the Torah was given. So you can't bring a you know a proof from before the giving of the Torah, but it's definitely a good 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 source. You know, it's a, definitely a nice source to, to have. So a good, good point, Thomas. Uh, someone else had a question here. Okay, I guess not. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, Andrew. I'm trying to unmute, there we go. Um, it's really an afterthought, but these days, all, a lot of male babies, I would think probably more than not, are circumcised, Jewish or not. So I'm, I know there's, you know, the thoughts that it's healthier and, and you know, uh, cleaner to be circumcised, but uh, I don't know if there is any thoughts on that in, you know, in the Jewish uh, thinking, our thinking towards that. I don't know if they think about it at all, but, uh, you know, it does happen, like I say, very often. Right, right. So it's true. It's true. There are um, uh, there, there, you know, there there are many goyim that ha that are circumcised, but uh, nevertheless, um, they do they do not uh, uh, develop the holiness and purity of the connection with Hashem through their circumcision, uh, because the, the 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 circumcision that affects the Jew is that he has a soul. And it's connected to the fact that the soul of the Jewish person is revealed with the circumcision and the non-Jew right. doesn't have the soul in the first place. So the soul is not being revealed. They just have a, a physical mark on their body, uh, but they don't, the soul is not revealed. So the, the, there is a major idea of the circumcision is that the soul becomes revealed on their, in their body with the circumcision. So that's that's by a Jew and not, not by a non-Jew. So it really is, is a major, <clears throat> makes a major may I difference. Make a response? What is may, that? Yeah, may I make a response? Me, sure. Jim. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to say there is a movement. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to say that um, uh, most babies are are circumcised uh, automatically, but there is a movement. Uh, I, I think it's small, still small in number, but growing, I'm told, to, to ban circumcision. Uh, this is something we have to be very uh, well aware of. And uh, we, uh, we should rise up uh, if, if the discussion ever gets, ever get, ever gets heated. Um, I remember um, hearing or reading Dr. Art Uleen uh, who gives medical advice? He who gives medical advice on, on television. And he would say that he left two of his sons uncircumcised. He didn't want them to go through this uh, procedure and then have it celebrated in a in a party uh, in a party atmosphere. Um, 
so uh, there is this uh, move, movement afoot. Okay. Th the yeah. same movement, the gentleman is right, the same movement is uh, affecting Europeans. Really, not only uh, not wanting the Jew to be circumcised for their children, but no kosher meat, etc. But Rabbi, I personally, Hashem went to 70 nations to accept the Torah, right? And they said no, in essence. But then he came to the Jews. And the women said, we'll guarantee the children. So that, to me, is the greatest mitzvah of all. Do you agree? I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, the, the Jewish people women said, received Anenu, the Torah. they said our yes. children will, will guarantee, right? But right. Every, the, the men and the women said that. Well, the way I've heard it, it's the women. Uh -huh. That was by Hasidic rabbis. All right. <laughs> Uh -huh. Look, okay. men, men serve a, a very good purpose. Uh -huh. okay, okay. Good, good point. Okay, let me, let me just conclude. We need the men. My time is just about up. So what, we, what, we, what comes out of here is that this is the one mitzvah that's very similar to our mitzvahs after the giving of the Torah, the mitzvah of bris milah. The circumcision mitzvah is, is unique. I wanted to see my hand. Well, then you have to Just see uh, mute here. everyone. Uh, the mitzvah of circumcision is very similar to the mitzvahs of after the giving of the Torah. And therefore, this was the mitzvah that, that Avraham wanted to be similar, to be fully like the mitzvahs, to be the one that's going to be the, the real pavement, the real paved road that, 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 that Avraham is going to pave for the Jewish people after him. And therefore, he chose the mitzvah of Mila. And, um, and because of that, um, this was the mitzvah that he waited until Hashem commanded him. So it'll be full-fledged mitzvah, similar to the mitzvahs that we are given, that Hashem asks us to do them. And by doing that, um, it, 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 he waited for a command from Hashem. And by doing that, he, he was able to uh, lead us and pave the road in all the mitzvahs um, by waiting for this mitzvah, waiting for Hashem to be the one to to command it. And, and the reason why this mitzvah is so unique is because it, it, it's so similar to the mitzvahs after the giving of the Torah that we are bringing the holiness into the physical body and we're bringing the holiness to last forever. So these two ideas that the holiness stays on, it stays spiritual, and it's in the physical body, that's what makes this mitzvah so unique. And that's why Abraham said, this is the mitzvah that I'm waiting for Hashem to fulfill, to, to command me. And then it'll be exactly like the mitzvahs that the Jewish people are going to do afterwards. And I will be able to pave the road for the Jewish people. And that concludes, uh, that concludes this uh, lecture of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. A great insight explains beautifully how we, why we have to, uh, why Avram waited uh, uh, for the command from Hashem.